Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to Barks May Ecology Club on Lycan. Um, Barks Ecology Club is a monthly gathering on the second Wednesday of each month to discuss a theme or topic that pertains to Barks' work um, and helps our community develop a deeper appreciation and understanding of the region's ecology. Um, go to the next slide. Um, Bark's mission is to transform Mount Hood National Forest into a place where natural processes prevail, where wildlife thrives, and where local communities have a social, cultural, and economic investment in its restoration and preservation. Since 1999, Bark has organized people um, from communities around Mount Hood National Forest to keep watch over the ecological conditions of the forest and the actions of the federal agency tasked with managing these public lands, the Forest Service. You can find more information at www.bark-out.org or find Bark on Facebook or Instagram at Bark for Mount Hood. Um, my name is Misha Van Eaton. I work as Bark's Forest Watch Assistant um, and I'm your host for tonight. And tonight we're lucky to have Mesa Miller um, to teach us about lichen. Um, before Mesa gets started, I would like to invite you all to participate in Bark's historical accountability um, statement and land acknowledgement practice. Um, next slide. Okay, so we're going to begin with um, Bark's historical accountability statement. Um, as an organization founded by white people in the lineage of settler colonial environmentalism, Bark understands that conservation work is embedded in the white supremacist legacy of colonization, of land theft, cultural erasure and genocide, and the systemic use of law to suppress native sovereignty over their homelands. We understand that Bark's dedication to protecting the stolen lands now referred to as the public lands of Mount Hood National Forest carries with it a paradox which continues to be ignored by most conservation groups and which continues to harm indigenous people. In our advocacy and policy work, Bark's interactions with federal agencies often comply with the authority assumed by the federal, US federal government. This authority was assumed through the legalized displacement and genocide of indigenous people and cultures, including through the legislative creation of public lands. These crimes and injustices have not been reconciled nor rectified. Today, all non-native people have the privilege of primary access to these public lands as a direct result of this, of this strategy of legalized supremacy. Bark recognizes that conservation organizations like ours are complicitly participating in the ongoing displacement of native people and culture each time settlers and other non-indigenous people claim the benefits of access to this land and by engaging the paradox of protecting stolen land. We are working to change the vision, mission, and strategies of our organization. Bark affirms that these are the rightful homelands of the Multnomah, Malala, Kalapuya, Chinook, Clackamas, Tenaino, Wasco, Wishram, Paiute, and the many other Native people who lived here and who have always lived here, who have always belonged to and cared for this land, and whose bold resistance to colonial oppression should guide us all. Now, I would like to respectfully invite any Native people here today to have a few minutes to speak freely. If you would like to speak, you can go ahead and unmute yourself, or you can type into the chat. Um, Bark is committing to the work necessary to repair relationships between settler descendants and Indigenous people, and between all non-Indigenous people on the land. Acknowledgement is just the necessary first step in this revolutionary cultural work. We ask all non-Indigenous participants to practice humility, respect, and acknowledgement by personally dedicating your time, energy, action, and resources to support people who rightfully belong to this land. If you have practiced acknowledgement with Bark before, please go get the notebook that you used for this practice. Um, if this is your first practice, please get something to write with. Give a few moments to do that. Okay. Um, please take the next two to three minutes to write some instructions, intentions, actions, and next steps for yourself, outlining how you will develop your practice of acknowledgement through action. If you've been at a recent Bark event, please revisit what you have set out for yourself to do and take this time to reflect on your efforts and update your intention and action plan. Okay. Um, please set aside your journal um, and turn your attention away from yourself. 
And please join me in a moment of respectful silence and contemplation and humility in honor of the original people here tonight across this continent in the past, present, and future. Okay. Um, thank you all for supporting this important practice and learning. Um, it is important that we all continue to practice acknowledgement through action in all areas of our lives. Um, okay, Mesa, I'll give it over to you. Hi, everyone. Great. Um, so I am here tonight to talk to you all about um, basically the lichens in our area and the Pacific Northwest, but more specifically in Oregon. Um, and just to give you a little bit of information about uh, what they are as organisms, as well as how they engage with the environment around them and what um, ecosystem services and functions they provide to uh, the natural world, but also to um, scientific, excuse me, applications. Um, like Misha said, there will be um, uh, basically like time for Q&A at the end of slides, um, pretty informal. So like if you have a question, just pop into the chat and Misha will let me know if there's questions after a slide and um, I'll do my best to answer them. And also there'll be a Q&A at the end as well. And at that moment, um, I would love to stop sharing the screen and just have, you know, informal questions, unless you all wanted me to go back to certain slides for those questions that would be considered for sure. But um, just to give you a little synopsis, and Misha is gonna give me a half an hour warning before it ends. And um, I guess just to give you a little background on myself, um, I have been living in Oregon for 13 years. I'm originally from Southern Maryland, the East Coast. And um, I went to Portland State University um, and got a bachelor's of science in environmental science and biology. Um, and when I was there, I was specializing in lichens at a uh, bryophyte lab, which bry bryophytes are non-vascular plants like mosses and hornworts and liverworts. But I was doing lichen work at that lab. Um, and after I graduated, I worked at Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center, um, RIP. And when I was at Opal Creek, I was doing outdoor ed and backpacking excursions, but I was also studying lichens on the side. And I um, went ahead and got a lichen certification after working at Opal Creek. So I'm a certified lichenologist, um, not so much in practice anymore. I was doing contract work for the Forest Service, um, but currently in my most recent career, I've been working out here on the Oregon coast in Tillamook County doing uh, basically native plant material production for restoration projects. So I work for Tillamook Estuaries Partnership and I produce coastally adapted genetically appropriate native plant material for restoration of salmon habitat, organ spotted uh, butterfly habitat, but also just general like ecos excuse me, watershed wide landscape scale restoration efforts. Um, so it really brings me a lot of joy to talk about lichens because I don't get to talk about that one very much anymore. Um, so without further ado, let's just jump on in. I'm going to just talk about what a lichen is. And um, basically, um, before I really give you a like detailed um, explanation, I just want to talk about how they're extremely prevalent. So um, there's actually 14 thousand lichen species worldwide and a thousand of them occur in um, the Pacific Northwest. Um, for those of you who don't know what a lichen is, it is a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungus where the fungus provides the structure for the algae to grow on and then the algae basically um, photosynthesizes creating sugars, carbohydrates out of sunlight and water and gives that back to the fungus to then make grow and make more structure to then provide more surface area to for the algae to then um, 
asexually propagate, like clonally propagate and take up more space and the lichen grows bigger that way. Um, we'll kind of get into that more, but basically um, the most um, common fun fungus or fungi that associates with lichens are ascomycetes. Um, there's different groups of fungus, but ascomycetes and basidiomycetes are um, the common ones that like associate with lichens um, and ascomycetes are the main ones. So there are 30,000 ascomycetes worldwide and 15,000 of them. So about half of them can be lichenized, which means can be in association with algae to become a lichen. Um, whereas only 25 different genera of algae can be lichenized. So that kind of brings us to the point that really fungus is the one that's creating the diversity. Um, so lichens are really cool because they're ancient, ancient beings. They've been around um, for over 500 million years, and they're one of the first organisms to colonize land. They've been, they were, were around before vascular plants. Um, so, and not, and I think before non-vascular plants as well. So um, just to give you a little bit of um, a kind of like a primary view of lichens, um, these, like I said, most lichens basically associate with ascomycetes, but here is an example of a lichen that associates with a basidiomycete fungus. So ascomycete fungi are basically those cup fungi, those little jelly fungi that you see out in the woods that are kind of look like an orange peel, or there's like a dark, um, I think a dark brown or black jelly fungi that you'll see. Also, I think um, not, um, which is butter, but one kind of similar. Anyway, so um, they're called sac fungi, and they make this kind of cup structure with their um, with their with their sexual organs. So they make a cup structure to produce their sexual organs. And that's pretty gonna be pretty important when I talk about um, lichen reproduction. But there are a couple um, lichens that that associate with basidiomycetes, which are these stem and cap, which is your typical mushroom, your mycorrhizal mushrooms that are like boletes or chanterelles, anything with a stem and cap. And um, I like this lichen omphalina or this omphalia um, umbelliferia because um, it's kind of like an example. I use it kind of creatively to show you an example of a very primitive like association between with between algae and fungus. Because what you have here are the, is this base layer of algae, and that is made up of these bundles of algae. So like here you have like a bundle of algae which is actually enveloped by fungal hyphae, hyphae, excuse me. Um, and that fungal hyphae is coming from these stems, these stem and cap fungi. So I like to use this example to just show people like how the lichen association is actually made. So basically like you have bundles of algae interacting with fungal hairs and that's where they exchange like carbohydrates and um, nutrients as well, which is more important in um, the lichens that you're probably used to seeing, like the, the leafy lichens and stuff like that. So we'll get to that. Um, are there any questions so far? Okay, I'm a very like visual animated person. So this is like actually really challenging for me because I just like want a whiteboard to like draw for you all. So just like throwing that out there. Um, here is another example of a basidiomycete lichen. It's multi-clava and it has these kind of cool like earth tongue structures and all on the base of this rotting wood is um, the algae. So this is moss, this more fuzzy stuff. Um, so this more blue green is the algae that is associated with these um, fungi. 
So they're very interconnected. Um, if you all know about um, the way tree roots associate with mycorrhizal fungus through like ectomycorrhizal or endomycorrhizal associations, basically tree roots and fungi are interacting underground to exchange nutrients and um, water and carbohydrates. And it's like the, the uh, forest highway, right? Or the forest internet. Um, the same thing is happening with these lichens. Um, so this fungus and this algae, it's the same concept. And that's what like really kind of geeks me out about this stuff. It's like, just like the forest scale system in a very micro like um, scale example. Okay. So in your like typical lichen, which is the ascomycete lichen, um, different than these basidiomycete lichens, we're now moving on to kind of the typical ascomycete that is kind of more of um, the ones you'd recognize in the woods when you're like, whoa, what is that a moss? And your friend is like, no, it's lichen. You're like, oh, I learned something new today, which is kind of cool. So then, <laughs> um, these typical um, lichens have different layers. And um, I just want to point out this drawing here that kind of uh, shows you a cartoon rendition of that. So basically you have your um, algal layer on the top portion of the lichen because that's where the sunlight is gonna hit, right? So you want those photons getting in there. And um, within the main body of the lichen, it's called the medulla or the medulla. Um, but I think medulla is actually the appropriate technical term. You have these hyphal hairs that take up the middle portion. And then you have an upper cortex and a lower cortex, just like skin. Um, and this is an example of a very common lichen that you'll even maybe see around Portland. Um, it's called Pladish Mesa Glauca, and it's um, the common name is ragbag lichen. <laughs> so <laughs> these, this cartoon rendition is basically uh, making a pretty simple drawing out of this more um, complex structure that was taken from a cross section of a microscope slide. Um, so that's like the typical structure of a lichen at least um, this more leafy lichen here. Can you repeat what the common name of that lichen was? Rag bag lichen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, the most simple partnership of a lichen is algae and fungus, but you also have a couple other partners. Most recently in the past like seven years um, or less, we've found out that yeast is actually um, a pretty important partner within a lichen structure. Um, apparently it helps the algae and the fungus actually engage with each, with each other. Um, and it also helps with like predatory, um, like herbivory uh, defense and possibly like UV radiation defense. Um, so yeast is kind of a cool discovery that we've had in the past less than a decade, but something we've also known about for a long time is um, that not only does green algae um, associated with lichen, but also blue green algae or another name for that is um, cyanobacteria. And so cyanobacteria is uh, ancient. It's one of the most ancient um, bacteria belonging in archaea and it is a nitrogen fixer. And that's really integral for our forests um, specifically because as, and I'll get into this a little bit more uh, later, um, but basically we need nitrogen in usable form and lichens are really helpful with that. So this is um, a cross section of Solarina crocea, or um, this one's fun. It's, um, I think it's called cookies and cream lichen. <laughs> Because if you look, it has these cute bundles of cyanobacteria on the top, and that's where they live. Um, so those bundles are nitrogen-fixing factories, which is pretty cool. 
So this is a cross section of a microscope slide that shows that bundle there. And then there's um, the photo layer of the green algae. So not only can this lichen fix nitrogen, it also can um, photosynthesize. So it's a pretty powerful little guy there, little lichen. Okay. So lichens don't only have um, or aren't only made up of these obligate partners of algae and fungus and sometimes cyanobacteria and yeast. Um, it's also like an ecosystem itself where in which epiphytic fungus and um yeah, up, uh, yeah, and algae will grow on top of the lichen structure. Um, so epiphytic just means like on plant. So the lichen structure is this cute little cloud like <laughs> drawing here. And then you have these um, like fungus. Here we go. Fungal mycobiont. OK, so basically, like there's also all these technical terms and I'm going to try not to throw too much jargon at you. Um, but so basically what this diagram is showing you is that this is the fungal structure of the lichen. And then you have your, um, your green algae, which is obligate. You need that, right? And then you have your cyanobacteria, which is also something this lichen needs and has with its, within its structure that's obligate. And then you have these epiphytic um, algae that are just growing on the surface and hanging out there. Like this um, lichenolius fungus is just kind of hanging out. It doesn't like have to be there, but it kind of is just growing on the structure. So when you get into lichen ID, um, it can be a little bit hard sometimes because you're like, whoa, this one looks weird. But then like you'll get your hand lens out and be like, oh, I think that's just like some scuzz like growing on top of the lichen. Um, <clears throat> but it's just like a mini ecosystem, which is kind of what I was saying earlier about like how it's kind of this forest ecosystem representation in a very small scale. Sweet, different lichen growth forms. So this is like pretty cool applicable information when you're walking through the woods. Um, so you can start discerning what you're actually seeing. Um, Cause I'm sure if you all are at this presentation you probably go out in the woods a lot and you're really curious. and um, it, this is something that you can take away from and use like really soon. Um, so these, this first growth pattern is called folios, which um, as it sounds means like leaf-like, right? Foliage. Um, and you see that really commonly. And I'll go through some slides that have examples of them. Um, what The one we're looking at right now is a ground lichen called peltidra or frog's pelt lichen, and it's all over the ground um, in Mount Hood, and there's several different species of it. Um, the previous slide that had the cross section of the structure with the upper cortex, the algae layer, the medulla, and the lower cortex is basically the quintessential like structure of a folios lichen. So some of the distinct characteristics of a folios lichen are that it has an upper cortex and a lower cortex. So it's usually different on top and on bottom. Um, so it has like stratified layers. Um, so that's a major component of a folios lichen. Whereas fruticose lichen, I like to think like fruticose, 3D, fruit-like, um, only has one cortex all the way around. So these are your hair lichens, like your usneas, right? Your old man beard, stuff like that. Um, also like horsehair lichens, bryorias, those brown lichens that are hanging off of trees. Um, another lichen that looks like usnea, but a lot of people um, think is usnea is alectoria lichen. Uh, like witch's hair lichen. Okay, and then you have your squamulose lichen and squamulose translates into little scales, um, which are basically your cladonias. And cladonias are like the lichens that grow, they can grow basically anywhere. Actually, they can grow in soil, they can grow on rocks, they can grow on um, tree boles and branches. Um, and 
they are so unique and diverse of a genus that they get their own growth form of this um, squamulose lichen. So the squamulose, like I said, means little scales. And um, if you look closely at a cladonia lichen, it will have a stalk. And then coming off of the stalk, they'll have these tiny structures that almost look like a folios lichen, and those are the scales. So they have these tiny, tiny scales or folios lichens coming off of there. Um, and the way you ID them is basically like, how many scales does the stock have? Um, like, does it have a different color underneath? Stuff like that. Um, the last growth form is crestose, which pretty um, obvious there's the crest lichens that kind of cover tree bowls and rocks and even sometimes soil. Um, and they're interesting because they don't have any lower cortex at all. They etch right into the substrate that they're growing on, which means that they're actually really good primary um, colonizers or like primary species. So they'll come in after disturbance and colonize the substrate and be able to start etching into it and breaking up the substrate very slowly over time and releasing like those nutrients and minerals. So then other plants can come like moss, for example, and moss will start creating soil. And then you have um, succession happening for like other small herbaceous forms to get in there or herbaceous plants. And then after that, you get your shrubs and stuff after a lot of time. Maybe we'll have time at the end. Um, I got a bunch of books behind me and I do have some slides about ecology that has different examples in there of folios lichens. Um, so those are the main growth forms of lichens. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? So um, lichen reproduction is pretty interesting um, and uh, a little bit complex because they're fungus basically that are doing the reproducing. Um, so what we have here are kind of those, that structure of the ascomycete, that, that cup fungus, right? So um, this structure here is called the apothecia and it is the re reproductive structure of the fungi. Now on the upper surface here, you got this cute, um, orange surface, and that's actually called the hymenum, which is basically like the upper surface, that layer that's covering the, the apothecia. And what that does is um, basically bears the spores. You know, it, it basically um, has these structures underneath them called ask and within the ascus, there's assai, and those assai are bundles of spores. And the spores are produced underneath um, the apothecia here, and they get pushed up. And as the ascus fills up with spore packets, it gets pushed onto the surface of the hymenum, and then they're dispersed. And they're pretty long lived structures. They're not ephemeral like flowers or um, mushrooms. They'll stay on the lichen structure for a long, like years and keep on. I mean, it's, I'm not 100% sure. I would assume that they keep on producing spores until, you know, that apothecia is kind of like worse for wear and it will start deteriorating and other apothecia have come up to take its place. So um, the structure there of the apothecia um, looks very much like the cup fungus or the sac fungus. Um, and I really like that analogy because it kind of shows how nature really just, if something works, it's gonna keep on using it. So this um, structure was carried through by fungi um, from being an individual ascomycete fungus to being an obligate associate with a, with a lichen. Because um, like, 
you know, when two and two, two, one and one don't always make two. One and one might make three. Like things are, when they combine, um, it might be more of the sum of its parts. Like when you think about like humans, yeah, like we're all these like molecules and like cells and like nerves and ion channels but somehow we have consciousness, like that's pretty freaking wild, right? So like we have these structures that come together and create something completely new, like the fungus and algae, and they're creating this entirely new organism. And they're taking these structures from evolution and like reusing them to um, have the same function. So I really like that. Um, We're looking at pumpkin pie lichen right now or ecro um excuse me oh man oh i'm forgetting um oh i can't believe i can't remember acrolicia i think and then this lichen is really common on alder trees so when you look at alder trees they have these white this white bark And um, it's when you look closely, it's actually not the bark like alders actually have gray bark. But um, when you go up to the next time you see an alder tree, go up to the bark and look close because it's that Eperlichia lichen and you'll see pumpkin pies all over it. Um, And that's really fun. So often people come and they're like, oh, the birches are so beautiful. I'm like, ha ha. But little did you know. Um, so anyway, that's the way, um, lichens produce sexually. And it's really interesting because it's the fungus reproducing. So what that means is that when a spore is released from a lichen, it still has to find an, an algae, a compatible algae partner to successfully make a new individual, which is pretty tough. You know, you have to have the right conditions, you have to have the right substrate, you have to have the right algae partner, and you're this tiny, tiny spore, and all of that has to line up for you to make a new individual. Um, so lichens have very clever ways of reproducing asexually. They have multiple ways. Um, this picture shows one of the ways, and it's called um, ceridia. So what we have here are these um, basically powdery granules or puff puff balls <laughs> and these powdery um, propagules uh, basically get dispersed and they create, uh, excuse me, they have both the microbiont and the photobiont. So they have both the fungus and the algae in a packet and they'll, they're dispersed through water, through insects, through sp- amphibians, um, through maybe some wind. Yeah, I would say so. And um, what they can do is then just land on a suitable substrate and then you have a clone that um, will then grow and make uh, the same individual that it came from. Um, So right here, is a soralia, and that is the producing structure of the little granules that are called ceridia. Okay, this is pretty cool. Um, this loxosporos, excuse me, sporospus. So this is um, a kind of like a crustos lichen, and it covers bark, and it just looks like a film. But like when you look really closely, it has these tiny, tiny um, structures on it uh, called isidia. And these these structures are like little fingerlings, like finger like outgrowths with a cortex surrounding, basically making the finger like outgrowth. And within it, you have those same little powdery granules. And I think the benefit of this is that you don't have just like one spore leaving the um, powdery like mass, you have a collection of spores in a very large packet that get broken off by, like I said, insects or um, amphibians or wind or rain 
or debris rubbing, you know, um, and they get dispersed and then can colonize another suitable substrate. For this lichen in particular, it's bark. Um, okay, then another way um, that lichens reproduce is fragmentation. So on the edges of this lobaria, uh, lobaria origana or organa, you have these um, fragment like structures that just kind of break off. And you can see it on a really windy day in like an old climax community or like old successional forest that is just like festooning with lichen biomass. Like you will see what we call propagule rain coming through the canopy when it's super windy. And um, all those are just fragments of lichens that are raining down to then colonize like lower branches of the trees um, if it hits one and has a suitable substrate to grow on. And then these are just like apothecias. So this is the spore producing layer. So not only is this like an employing um, cool ways of asexually propagating with these fragments, but it also has these really awesome apothecia that will produce spores to give it a chance to like have individuals, right? To make new individuals. Um, but it's kind of, you know, having its eggs in more than one basket, um, no pun intended. And then this is just, you know, cool information. These um, kind of ridges here, in the concave section of these ridges, um, I think they're called heterocytes. And within those, there are bundles of cyanobacteria. And so this lichen is super important because it's a nitrogen fixer. Um, it's one of our most important lichens in the Pacific Northwest because of that attribute. Ooh. Pin lichens are fun, so um, they're fun to talk about. These are micro lichens. They're kind of like crust lichens. They have, this is their primary structure here on a surface of wood. And then um, to reproduce, they create these stalks with these um, specialized reproduction, a reproductive structure it's called um, mazadium. So these mazadiums are kind of like apothecia but um, they create way like a, just like this mass of spores that just push out of um, this area. I don't even know if a mesadium has a hymenum because um, it just looks like it's just spores in mass coming out. They like literally have this like effect where they erupt out and just keep on getting produced. These are so small, you need a hand lens to like see these structures um, it, in this type of detail um, or a microscope. But um, they grow in really particular habitats as well. So um, they don't really like direct moisture. Um, they don't like getting rained on, and but they need moisture, like ambient moisture. So um, they grow in areas where they can receive that. So like if there's a snag here leaning on trees, they'll grow here because they're on wood, they're not getting direct um, rain. They're just getting that like ambient mist of the tempered rainforest, right? Um, then there's other places where you can find them um, if you're just looking at areas that would not get direct rain. Um, so another thing is that, that they don't really like living wood, but you'll find them on live trees. Like for example, where I found them is like in the cavities of trees that have like rolled out um, after like a fire event or something. There's like parts of the tree that are dead um, so that you'll find them like within that cavity um, protected from direct rain. Yeah, stumps partial burn areas. Yeah, and this kind of shows that with more managed forests, you just have less habitat for pins. 
So pins have kind of become um, a species that is an indicator species for like more mature, uh, healthy forests that have more diversity of um, habitat types. So these um, more managed forests just don't have the habitat for pins. Cool, like an ecology. How are you feeling? Any questions? Um, one question, can lichen spores persist after a wildfire? Um, and do you know how they do it? Can lichen forests persist? Spores. Spores. Um, I don't know if they persist after a wildfire. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm like thinking. <laughs> I think it probably just depends on the heat. Um, yeah, and where they would where they would be in relation to the wildfire. And um, if they're in like in terms of if they're already on a substrate and that substrate burned, probably not. But like if they were in the air and then landed, um, once the fire subdued. I mean, but then there's the question of if there's suitable habitat for them to land on. Um, and I don't know how long spores persist for um, and are still viable. So that's a good question. Okay, so one of the things that we were talking about is um, lichen uh, nitrogen fixing attributes. So this is just like such an important, important um, ecosystem service. And especially in like higher elevation areas where salmon are not able to swim up um, into those like smaller tributaries um, within our watersheds. So like salmon are these incredible organisms that bring marine nitrogen from the ocean up into our watersheds and then um, die after spawning. And then their decomposition releases a huge influx of usable nitrogen into our ecosystems, which like we are totally uh, obligate to receive. Every single organism uses nitrogen. Um, it's in our phospholipid backbone of our DNA. It's like used in enzymes and um, cofactors for proteins. It's just like so essential. And um, I think 72% of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, but it's in a very stable form. It's an N2 and you need um, nitrogen to be broken and um, made into like, I think like, um, this is where I'm gonna show some um, maybe um, inconsistencies in my knowledge, but it needs to hook on to like an oxygen or a oxygen hydrogen group and to be able to be absorbed by the organisms. So these nitrogen fixing lichens that have the cyanobacteria are able to basically absorb N2 from the atmosphere and fix it into our, into usable forms that then can be absorbed within the ecosystem and go up trophic levels to then be available for the organisms. Um, so what you see here is um, that low barrier oregana and this um, very wonderful lichen is actually also very fast growing. It can grow in biomass like impressively quick for a lichen. Most lichens are pretty slow growing. Um, I think that in The Hidden Forest, which is um, a book that is worth reading, it states that they're in an in a old growth or a late successional forest, there's as much as like 500 um, pounds of like low barrier oregana biomass in a um, dry, dry low barrier Oregon of biomass in a mature forest. And that's pretty essential because when that lichen, 
falls to the ground from the canopy, it will start decomposing and release all that nitrogen. And then that's available for plants to take up, which is then available for insects to take up, which is then available for birds to take up, and then available for other for predators to take up, and um, all the way to, yeah, to us in some ways as well. So these slower growing lichens are also nitrogen fixers. You have um, the um, really cool cyanobacterias. And I actually have a slide of this, so I'm gonna move on. Yeah, so um, I already talked about Loberia oregana, and this is its um, relative, or, or uh, excuse me, Loberia pulmonaria. And as you can see, um, you can actually tell the difference if you go out and look at these lichens. Um, Loberia oregana has these frills, those fragments that um, fragment off into asexual crocodiles. And that's the kind of the difference between oregana and pulmonaria. Pulmonaria has a very smooth margin. Also, what's lining the margin are ceridia. So if you get a hand lens and look closely at a pulmonaria lichen, it will have ceridia, which are those um, asexual um, propagules that are really powdery. Um, that will be lining the margin of pulmonaria. So that's how you can tell the difference. Also, pulmonaria um, does sometimes have apothecia, but not usually not as much as oregana in my experience. Um, but yeah, they're also uh, an indicator of like a healthy um, forest as well. So that's one thing about um, nitrogen fixing lichens. They're pretty sensitive to air quality and excuse me, to air pollution. Um, so lichens, are used by scientists and by the Forest Service to indicate air quality because lichens don't have roots, you know, they absorb everything from the ambient atmosphere around them. So that means that they also absorb like pollutants and um, they also absorb nutrients. That's how they get their nutrients. Um, so that means they're also absorbing like too much nutrients, right? And um, these lichens in particular, these uh, nitrogen fixing lichens are ex pretty intolerant of air pollution. So we can use that to indicate the air quality of a specific region or site. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but I just want to point that out. And these um, are really cool little lichens that you'll find in healthy forests. These are the nephromas um, or mouse ear lichens. These are their apothecias. They curl up. And so that underneath of them, you get your um, apothecia structure. And then um, these are the ceridia of this parel nephromia. And um, yeah. This is a pretty rare or uncommon, I should say. This is a pretty uncommon nephromia. Okay. I've got one question. Um, Lynn asked, when would a lichen use sexual versus asexual reproduction? It's kind of just continuous. So um, they'll create these structures and they're always kind of producing spores um, continuously. So for example, the Loberia has both apothecia and these fragments. And once those structures are created, they're just continuously kind of using them um, pretty freely. Um, what is interesting is like the balance between stress and no stress. So um, if you go out in Portland and you see, for example, like, Hypogymnia physodes um, is a pretty common like species in Portland that you will see is like overproducing its sexual structures because it is extremely stressed out from the air pollution. Um, so there's this balance where like 
you know, an organism, when it's so stressed, it will overproduce its sexual structures because it also has like an abundance of some nutrients in Portland, it's nitrogen. There's a lot of nitrogen in there, um, nitrous oxide from fossil fuels. So um, in a area that does not have a lot of nutrients and the lichen is stressed, then it won't be able to produce as many sexual structures. So it's really about um, availability of resources to be able to do more than just grow a structure, uh, excuse me, the primary structure. Um, the secondary structure is usually the sexual structure. And once there's enough um, basically nutrients and carbohydrates for a lichen to do that, then it will do that. And in terms of like, would they do asexual um, or sexual and what parameters it would take to for a lichen to like respond? Um, I think that I can't really answer that directly. I can just say that if they have the option to do both, they usually have both sexual structures on them and are continually producing either spores or propagules to just um, exfoliate them continuously. Thanks, and time check at 7.30. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I think I'm doing pretty good. Okay, the pseudocyphalarias are really fun. Um, they're really fun lichens. This one, crocata, is super fun because it has these ceridia that are on the top of the thallus, excuse me, the lichen structure. Thallus is just another word for the lichen body. And then um, these marginal ceridia are really fun too, just because like they're lime green. I mean, that's really cool. And then um, mul mulata is um, a more typical pseudocyphalaria. And then over here is anthrapsis, which these two actually, I think, um, have recently been um, genetically verified to be the same species. They just have, there you go, they just have different ways of producing sexually. So this one only does asexual production and this one does only does sexual production. And um, I don't think we know why, you know, the lichens just have a certain way that they like to sexually express themselves. Um, so, or asexually express themselves. So this lichen is actually super duper special. It's um, Pseudocyphalaria rainierensis, and it um, produces ceridia on its margins and also on the um, main thallus, but also um, this is, basically an old growth indicator lichen. It's only found in intact old growth forests. And um, there's a story about this um, lichen in terms of bark. So bark um, took out a group to ground truth a uh, timber sale. And um, I don't know if Michael remembers the name of the timber sale because um, I sure don't, but um, basically, uh, John Bellella, one of my mentors, and a bot he's a botanist and a lichenologist, and um, he went out with the bark crew to show them what rainierensis looks like and just to tell them what it looks like and say, hey, if you find it at this timber sale, you know, we could um, potentially stop the timber sale. And um, he described how it looked, and then everyone kind of like branched off, and um, one person I was like, hey, is this it? And it was literally just covering like a tree, which was really cool. So we had um, at least that section buffered. And I think that they found it in other sections to buffer different um, parts of the timber sale. Um, Michael's going to have to correct me if I'm wrong about that story, but it's something to that effect. So it definitely has helped in this, um, basically, the this basically saved a unit from being logged, which is awesome. Michael says it was the solo timber sale. Oh, solo. Cool. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're going to talk about, um, we're going to segue off of nitrogen fixation and we're going to talk about nesting material for birds. So um, there's a pretty cool lichen out there. Many lichens are used for nesting material, um, like the hair lichens are great for nesting material. This lichen in particular called Parmelia sulcata or nature's Velcro um, is a wonderful wonderful material because it has these little rhizomes which are root like structures at the on the lower cortex of its thallus and um this humming the, our resident hummingbird the rufus will go around and find this lichen in particular it's actually a pretty good lichenologist it will go find in this species and make its nest out of it so um it's really fun um i've never found a nest with covered by parmelia but i've definitely found some nests with lichen in them and that's really um endearing to see um and then we're going to talk about some food chain stuff so like prioria lichens and other lichens are essential food in the winter for um different species for example, ungulates like caribou and reindeer eat lichens like exclusively in northern regions. And um, when no other food sources are available, they their lives literally depend on lichens. Um, and so does like do squirrels and other rodents. So um, it's really sweet. Like in the winter, squirrels like the northern flying squirrel will like collect um, Brioria and line their nests with it and just not only line just like make their nests out of this lichen and they'll just like chill in the winter and like munch on these lichens in their nest and um, I just like kind of had this dream of like if I had like an edible like nest to just like chill in that would like, be so <laughs> so um, cozy and maybe not so glamorous but like I'd like to imagine it would also be glamorous <laughs> but um, so Brioreas are really special because, excuse me, let me clarify. Brioria is this hair lichen here. Um, they're really special because the northern flying squirrel depends on them and the organs, excuse me, the northern spotted owl depends on the flying squirrel for a winter food source. And we all know how important the spotted owl has been to um, basically preserve large swaths of old growth forest in the Pacific Northwest, especially through the eighties. Um, so another little food web um, example is this really, this is also like a really fun way to highlight that there are aquatic lichens, if you didn't know, um, newsflash. So we got this really cool lichen that's a Peltigera lichen that um, grows on rock in, um, nice like clear mountain streams of the Pacific Northwest. It's called, um, uh, excuse me, Peltigera hydrotheria. And then you have these really cool macro invertebrates that munch on them. And then you have like the oozel or the American dipper that will munch on the macro invertebrates. So that's just like another fun food chain. Um, example of how lichens are really important, not only for nesting material, but also for food. Um, and then I'm going to kind of talk about the um, indication of air quality using lichens again. Um, I touched on it with nitrogen fixing lichens, but I'm going to give a little bit more detail here. So the Forest Service has been collecting data on through its air resource management program since like the 70s by um, basically going out to field sites and taking lichen samples from those field sites and putting them through a mass spectrometer and basically combusting the lichen and they can measure the the percentage of a certain element within a lichen structure by going through that process. And that will give you the percentage of that element within the atmosphere that the lichen came from. So they do it with like lead and chromium and nickel, but also like nitrogen and sulfur. And um, this is a map um, from the seventies that show, I would really love to see Eugene now, 
um, that show different areas. So Portland, so the darker the color, the, the um, more concentration was found. Um, oh, actually, now that I read this, uh, it says decreased lichen diversity. So there's two ways to monitor air quality. So the one that I told you about, like combusting the lichen and measuring the elements, but there's also, um, you go out to an area and you basically assess the populations of lichens. So you assess the abundance of the different lichen species within the community. And you assess if those lichen species are tolerant or intolerant to pollution. So there's all these protocols through the Air Resource Management Program that um, basically tell you it, um, a scale of like tolerance to intolerance in terms of lichen species. And you go out and you assess the community of certain sites and you use that scale to then grade the system, excuse me, the site um, in terms of air quality. So this right here kind of shows that um, the results from a study like that all through um, the Willamette Valley. And just to like give you more of a visual on how this is all happening. So like Platysmatia glauca or ragbag lichen is the quintessential like lichen to use for these studies. It just has a great structure for um, collecting uh, these basically elements and pollutants in its ambient atmosphere, but not leaching them out too soon. So other um, lichens will leach them out really quick and not really give an accurate um, read of the ambient atmosphere. But um, this, this lichen structure of Platysmatia glauca or ragbag lichen has proven to be the most reliable for air quality indication. So this is just like a visual of how the lichen, like I said before, it doesn't have roots. It obviously like doesn't eat its food. So the way it's able to absorb its um, nutrients and water is from the ambient atmosphere. It's like a sponge, it just absorbs everything. So it's absorbing also um, excess nitrogen, excess sulfur, um, here you go, the NO3. Uh, it's also absorbing like nickel, here you go, NH4. It's, all, it's um, absorbing lead and copper. It's absorbing um, nitrous oxide, chromium. And what happens is that they all get stuck in its um, medulla because it doesn't know how to process this stuff. It doesn't know how to process zinc. It doesn't know how to process copper. Um, it's not evolved to do that. So if it doesn't process this stuff, it just kind of stays within here and it bioaccumulates. So then we can take that lichen and we can put it through a mass spectrometer and combust it. And we can then measure how much of its concentration has lead, for example, or zinc or copper. Um, so these um, lichens, when they bioaccumulate this stuff, are either more tolerant to be able to withstand that or less tolerant. And that's where those like cyanobacteria come in, excuse me, the cyanolichens, the nephromas and the pseudocyphilaries that I was talking about earlier, um, they are very intolerant to to this type of pollution. So you just won't find them in these large population areas. You won't find them in Portland. You won't find them in Salem. Um, Al Albany had a paper pulp in the 70s, a paper pulp mill. So that like is why that is such a dark spot. So I don't know if you'd find them now since the mill closed down, but probably not. You find those cyanolichens out in the West Cascades, you know, or like places that have um, more intact forest systems that are um, filtering, that are away from big population centers. Um, so here's just like a graphic rep representation of how these elements um, get stuck in the medulla, excuse me, yeah, the medulla of the lichen. So um, 
I get, I'll take a couple minutes to talk about my study and then we can um, just open it up for questions. So um, in 2013, I was um, basically offered to um, execute a study on Mount Hood wilderness doing um, an air quality assessment uh, of the wilderness area using lichens as bio indicators. And I volunteered for the Forest Service doing this. So in 1993, um, the Forest Service took samples of lichens from 35 different plots um, kind of in the wilderness and national forest of Mount Hood. And then 20 years later, I was um, I had the opportunity to go back and resample the same species, ideally the same species from the same plots to have a retrospective study of how um, air quality was affected in those 20 in that 20 year time frame. So basically the 1993 study was a baseline study and then 2013 was a revisit to see how those baseline concentrations had changed. So um, the main takes that I got from that, um, I got a lot of data and I summarized it down to like basically um, significant changes. So these graphs, as not only significant changes, but also like percent changes, like general percent changes. So um, these graphs show those percent changes in certain elements. Um, and just to also um, describe the different colors. So um, I also took for the samples of four different species. There's platysmatia, excuse me, platysmatia glauca, which is the purple. And then there's um, hypogymnia entromorpha which is the blue, and then Hypogymnia inactiva, which is the um, kind of red, and then there's Alectoria somnitosa, which is the green. And um, just to show the trend, just plotted them on um, a 0% line and showed basically that the mass majority of, um, for example, the change of nitrogen from 1993 to 2013 showed like a 40% change. So it's decreased in most of the samples um, up to 40%. There are some increases like this weird 80% increase in Alectoria. However, like I was saying, like Alectoria is the least dependable species to do this type of study on. For some reason, it's substra it's um, surface area, its structure is just not that great for indicating air quality because the of the way that new, that the elements will just leach off of the substrate when it's raining. It will just like leach off and not really get absorbed. So Plasmacia glauca has proven to be the most dependable species for these types of studies. Um, sulfur was pretty interesting. You got like um, like a hundred percent decrease in some of the samples, like for example, hypogymnia inactiva um, and hypogymnia entromorpha, but then you have increases in um, plasmacia glauca and alectoria somnitosis kind of um, both. So sulfur was a little bit inconclusive, but um, with really large uh, decreases, in hypogymnia, so that was like worthy to note. Um, this is pretty epic. This is, you can't see it. Well, I can't see it because I have a, square, a share screen um, icon. I don't know if you all have it, but so this is lead um, and you have an 80% decrease in lead um, basically from 1993 to 2013. And it's consistent across all species, which is super cool. Um, then you have an increase in zinc that's consistent across all species and an increase in copper that's consistent across all species. So um, very interesting. Um, I also have some maps to show where these increases are happening and decreases are happening. So 
these are um, the, this is for nitrogen, percentage of nitrogen, and you'll just see these decreases of um, nitrogen per species. So this is Alectoria, there is a uh, decrease here, and then this is Hypogymnia, there's decreases here. And then um, this is Plasmatia glauca or ragbag lichen. And the most, the biggest decreases are here. Um, so then let's see, sulfur, you have big decreases here in the hypogymnia species, which is pretty cool. Um, and sorry, I didn't really explain this very well. So the blues, um, are decreases and the reds are increases and the the size of the circle is how um excuse me is like the proportion of the change there we go okay so this is pretty interesting um copper copper has increased like there has been really no decreases it's been increasing like basically across the board between all th uh, three species. So um, I know that in this slide, I had two species here, but they're the same genus. Um, and I had a really small sample size for Inactiva. So that's why in these maps, I just have one map for the Hypogymnia species. Um, zinc is kind of the same thing, it's increasing. Um, especially around here. And then um, lead has shown some significant decreases and um, especially like along the 26 here, which is great. It basically like really tells the story that um, when leaded gasoline was banned in 1996, like lichens are showing that change in um, our regulations. So that's really cool. Um, copper and zinc, I, when I was doing this study, I really was trying to get down to the bottom of why we're having these increases. And um, the best thing I could um, kind of summate was that um, like in California and Washington, they have banned zinc and copper in their brake pads because it sheds off and off your brakes every time you break your car and it gets into the waterways and it actually messes with the IAM channels of salmon um, so that they don't function as well. And uh, Oregon has not passed any legislation to decrease um, I, a zinc and copper in their brake pads. And I just wonder if um, somehow it's getting in the air from being shedded from people's brake pads. Also, we've had like an increase of visitor visitation onto Mount Hood, like millions and millions of people go to Mount, well, millions and millions of people have like moved to Portland and, you know, you know in the last 30 years. Um, and the a vast majority of those people visit Mount Hood. So I just wonder if there's a correlation there. Let's see. Okay, sweet. I'm going to stop share. And um, if anyone has any questions, um, I'd be down to, yeah, field them. Well, Michael, go ahead. Hey, Mesa. I, Thanks. This was great. Um, I'm I'm wondering, I guess, without giving away any secrets, um, if you could maybe give folks any, any ideas of places to go if they're really interested in in learning about and looking at lichens. Um, maybe some places with some high species diversity. Um, yeah. Any ideas about that? Yeah, totally. I mean, I really love the east side of um, Mount Hood for like the wolf lichen, Letheria. It's really fun. And there's some really cool rock lichens um, to check out on the east side of Mount Hood too. Um, normally, we'd be doing a lichen hike 
And we've gone to Old Maid Flats, which has been just like such a fun place to be. Um, it has a lot of diversity because um, it's kind of like this interesting area where um, is the most recent um, in terms of like lava flow activity. Um, so it's got this really interesting geology where it's almost like primary successional. So you have these like sandy um, primary successional, like almost, I don't want to call them meadows, but um, just like lowlands almost of like a reindeer lichen cover that's just like, and Cladonia lichens just covering um, the sandy uh, environment by the sandy river, the sandy soils of the sandy river. And then you have these like shore pines or lodgepole pine um, valley side lodgepole pines coming up. And um, you then you have like Usnia longissima. So, um, oh gosh, I don't know the common name for Usnia longissima, but it's basically like, it's a very long lichen that has these very long tendrils. It's actually the longest lichen in the world, which is pretty cool. It can get up to like nine meters. Um, and you can also find some nitrogen fixing lichens at Old Maid Flats as well. So I definitely recommend Old Maid Flats. And then, um, I mean, it's not really open, but Opal Creek is just like lichen heaven. So um, maybe not right now, but I'm sure that I have faith that it will come back. So um, really anywhere that has um, older growth forest or late successional forest, um, things grow pretty fast out here. So even those late successional forests that aren't quite old growth will have really nice lichen diversity. I would just try to get, get into the bosom of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Bring oh yeah, this plans. is recording. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, Michael? We'll edit that part out. Oh no, bring your bring your hand lens. That's something I've learned. Is yes. it's so fun to just get really, you know, down to the really micro. It's it's so it's such an interesting change of perspective that I observe a lot when people get get that into something that's so small. Something weird happens where they can afterwards kind of zoom out and really see the big picture even better so it's it's such a fun such a fun time looking at lichens we'll get a lichen hike going on next year i hope so i really miss you guys um one other thing about what michael said it's really fun to go on hikes with people because like you're describing these lichen structures and then like you actually hand somebody a hand lens and they're just kind of like you know, absorbing the information and then they get the hand lens and they look at the leg and they're just like, whoa, you weren't kidding. <laughs> like, that's pretty interesting looking. And they do really look like alien, little alien landscapes um, and pretty intriguing structures. Yeah, like little Dr. Seuss characters. Any other questions? Well, I would love to just um, make one more comment about lichens as like ecos um, for in terms of ecosystem functions, because, you know, without being in the woods, it's it's hard to really like capture this. But when you go out to the woods and you look into the canopy or even like onto like a, the, the mossy ground and you just see like layers of moss and lichen either on the ground or within the canopy of a tree. Like, I don't know if you all are familiar with um, big leaf maple, but big leaf maple is just quintessential for having, or like known for having these, like what they're called club arms of like moss, just huge club arms of moss mats. And when you get that layering of moss and lichens, something really incredible happens where you just have these like micro scale ecosystems and that's super essential um, in terms of like kind of zooming in and noticing that like everything is scalable. So like you have like the ground that we stand on and there's like birds and like predators and like fish, 
and like macro insects. But then like when you get down to like a branch or even just like next to a rock and you scale in, the same stuff is happening there. It just like on a, le- a smaller level. So you have protists and like, um, like tardigrades and like very small insects um, and calendula, which are these like these little springtails that actually have been um, studied and show to aid in like moss pollination. So you have these very small scale ecosystems that function a lot like um, our ones that we're used to. And just knowing that that's happening um, almost like on a multi-dimensional like steps is just kind of changes your perspective about like the complexities of um, how the life functions um, and how the earth functions. So, um, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, when you look at a huge moss mat and um, like lichens layer, just, you know, um, try to like do, do some due diligence to not like take it for granted and just like really reflect on how complex um, the earth like holds um, life and the interactions of of where like that interconnectivity occurs. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Mesa. Um, yeah, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, that was a whole presentation. So much, so much knowledge. Um, it'd be lovely to go on a hike with you. Um, get yeah. to see like in person. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here. And it's eight o'clock, so it's perfect timing. Wrap it up. Thank you, everyone. It was my absolute pleasure. <laughs>